there's a curve that you'll be talking about soon, a disruption curve, where a product is introduced and it flops or it doesn't, and then it, it's very slow in the beginning, usually. There are very few products which start right out of the bat totally successful. And sometimes journalists forget that, and they say, oh my gosh, this product hasn't sold a million units the first year, it's not successful, or this app hasn't been picked up. But the truth is, it does take time, and it takes public voting with their dollars, and it takes good technology out there. But how do you personally navigate the innovation adoption curve? How do you make a decision about timing, whether something's ready now? I watch the emotion people show. Last year, I w went to the Oculus booth here at CES, and I, I watched people get private demos at Web Summit last year. And every single person who left the demo used an expletive and said, I've never seen anything like that. So I, I started getting very bullish about uh, VR, and I, th I think the world is just about to so get a taste of that. how do you tame, because you're incredibly enthusiastic about tech. Where are we in 2016 in terms of what's ready? Ultra HD is coming along, 4, we call it 4K. You is know. that a big deal? I'll, I'll, yeah, every time you, you know, come people to CES, are you hear about people, HD. People just now, I mean, that's been out, what, how many years have we seen Ultra HD at CES? Three or four years, right? And it's just now where there's some content to watch on the things. You care about that? Yes, because that's, a, that's how it goes from the nerds like me and Andy to, um, you know, to, to my, my dad, right? My dad's not going to buy a TV that has no content. Right, uh, your Amazon Echo right now it's for the nerds. It's 10% of this audience, and it's 1% of or less of my normal audience. But is this stuff inevitable in the long term? Is I, I think it is because when people experience these new things, they say, "Man, that is cool. I want that," and they start thinking about, "Oh, I need to put that on my Christmas list for next year." Right? Because most people don't buy things within 10 minutes of seeing them, like, like all of us do because we're here at the <laughs> CES show, right? Most people, you have to hear about it for 13 times, uh, marketing classes told me, right? You have to hear about something 13 times before you even start thinking about buying it. But we remember how creeped out people were with Google Glass. Is, are, 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 have people caught up with this idea yet? Uh, no, the, I mean, Robert and I both know. The issue with Google Glass wasn't the technology, it was the way it looked. So if you look at some of the new glasses that are coming out, and how they're more hiding the projectors and the viewers. If you, there are some new ones coming out in the next few weeks. When, when you see those, you don't really notice that they have the technology in it. it, it that's one of the reasons why Misfit Shine did so well, because you didn't realize it's a tracker. Women can wear it as a brooch. So that, that's where fashion tech comes in. Bruce, you've been in this business a while. How has the consumer changed over the last five to 10 years? They're slowly beginning to understand the self-driving, the reason behind the tech. Why do you, why did you need a, a I mean, walking 10,000 steps, I'm a fat guy, it doesn't really matter. Um, but it's, it's the next, it's the beginning of the data collection. And then after that, the, more and more data that we collect. He's, the consumer's starting to understand the utility that they're going to get for giving up some of their privacy. On a trip, it, it told me my flight was being canceled and gave me a choice to buy a new ticket. And it saved me a night because there was only three seats on that plane, uh, plane ticket. And two minutes later, the pilot came on and said, we can't start an engine, we're going back to the gate. Having utility, and there is deep utility in this stuff, gets people over the freaky line. But they have to hear these stories. You know, GoPro started a couple hundred yards from my house. And it was started by Nick Woodman, who was a surfer. And he wanted to take a picture of himself in a wave. And he didn't know how to develop a product. I mean, he didn't even have the skills Andy has, right? So he hand-stitched on his mom's sewing machine a, a prototype of what, how a camera would snap onto his wrist out in the wave and sent it to a factory in China. And they, and they built, him, built it, and he started selling them to other surfers. And he had not taken venture capital at that point. He was reinvesting the money from the company back into the into the company trying to convince normal people that this camera was amazing and he said I bought Oprah because normal people were watching Oprah and they could see that my camera was the same quality as the professional cameras that shot Oprah so he was very good at thinking about story and how to get out of the nerd world and get a product that everybody would recognize, right? Uh, so I get really excited with new technology. Yeah. But when I actually try it out, it either really works or it fails. Yeah. And it goes in the drawer and I, I never see it again. Yep. As a consumer, like, 
I'm not going to spend a lot of money on this. They call it the bleeding edge for yeah. a reason. It, cu it cuts you sometimes, right? 